are talking about pantsing today, um, making the most of draft zero. I'm gonna have all of us introduce ourselves. I'm a writer, these people I'm guessing are what, right? No, I know them. I know they're writers. They're much better than I am. And they're gonna have a lot of good advice for you, so I will be doing most of the question asking and letting them impart their wisdom to you. Um, so why don't we go ahead and start with? Yeah. Okay, yeah, my name is Christopher Husberg. I write dark epic fantasy. Uh, my first book, Duskfall, came out uh, in 2016, and uh, book four in the series is coming out this June. So uh, it's a five-book series, so we're just plugging right along there. Um, I am what I like to call, uh, as of like three hours ago, as I was thinking about this panel, a reformed discovery writer. Um, so I, I'll maybe talk about what that means a little bit later. Um, but I have I've discovery written many things. I have also tried. Yeah, I don't know. I may be like the like the uh, the mole on this panel. Or that's the like, witch. but but uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, we'll see how this goes. My name is Peter Arulian. I have a, a current epic fantasy series with Tor. Um, I'm very proud of some fiction I've done recently. Some novels where I've novelized. Um, progressive metal albums from bands like Dream Theater, and uh, just announced that I'm doing a collaboration with Brandon Sanderson for a new urban fantasy series. Does that no big deal. Yet, <laughs> no, if you're a Sanderson fan, you've heard him talk about something he calls Death by Pizza. Um, Death by Pizza started out with this idea that um, this pizza delivery guy delivers a pizza and gets shot and wakes up as a necromancer. Uh, and that character is a musician, very heavy into me heavy metal culture. And so he and I got talking just about not, not books and writing together, but it became clear after our talking that we should do this series together. So we decided to do it. And the, the story idea has evolved quite a bit from that kernel. But if you know Death by Pizza, that's the genesis of this series. Uh, I'm Jessica Day George. I am a best-selling author of 15 fantasy books. Some are middle grade, some are young adult, and um, I am, yes, knitting myself a sweater up here before you need to ask, and I am a dedicated pantser. I am a dyed-in-the-wool pressed pantser. Yes. <laughs> I was once asked by my editor to please outline a book because I was having trouble with it and after two days I had a paragraph of outline and my husband called my editor behind my back and said I, I can't live with her any longer just tell her she can throw away the outline and I got permission to pants again <laughs> Dance again. Like, yeah. I, I appreciate that. Okay. So, I'm loving this panel already because I'm not going to lie, in, especially in sci fi and fantasy, because we tend to have a long, big scope series, pantsing is a bit looked down on. Yes. It feels like sometimes. People if you have trying. not mapped out your 12 book epic and and drawn drawn the shire yes you're in trouble and designed your languages yes and how the robots rebel yes then i mean you can't call yourself a real fantasy or science fiction author um and i've actually struggled with that um so i would like to know what you guys think are the merits of this style of drafting. I'm undrafting. Um, <laughs> uh, I will often, how I will get started is I will think of either a cool concept or a cool character or both at the same time and I will try to put them together. And if you are so married to your outline, if that is not <coughs> the character that should go on that adventure, you can write a bad book. I have many times been taking my char character, you know, through to Mordor or something and then gone, this is not what this person should be doing. This is a job for a totally different person. And so I, I find that when I've talked to people who are outliners and they're struggling, a lot of times I'm like, well, what, what if it wasn't that person? Or what if instead of going to Mordor, they really did go see the eagles and the eagles took them to Mordor? And they're like, but that's not in the outline. But it doesn't have to be. I've done that many times where I've decided, hey, what about the eagles? When I thought we were going to be walking. The eagles, right? The eagles, man. 
Should have called him sooner. <laughs> the um, I for me the the inherent falsehood um, for people who deride outliners. How's that for an opening? Um, <laughs> is that is that they're it's slavish? Kind of funny. No, no. Deriding the, outliners. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> AKA Jessica George. <laughs> it, no, it's just this idea that um, most outliners are slavish to their outlines. If that's you, then um, may, you know maybe you can take some some use out of a, a revised way to be an outliner. For me, I, there are sometimes I just straight do pantsing, but I've actually interviewed a whole bunch of writers on this topic. And what I find is the vast majority of writers <laughs> fall in the middle, and which is to say they have a very loose outline. Uh, it's not prescriptive. Uh, sometimes it's a single sentence or idea for a scene. Some scenes are very detailed because they know very clearly it's a pivotal scene, they know it needs to happen. But all it does is it creates kind of like those coloring books. There's a, there's a vague outline of an image you know you want to create. Um, but you can color outside the lines. And revision and creation happens all the time. And you give yourself license to do that. And all of the writers I've spoken with have said, I have some, some outlining. Now, there's, there is a different extreme of this, which is, uh, which is Brandon. And, and <laughs> clearly, he's doing something right. Yes. But I can tell you that like, um, I've, I've now participated in that world, and I've generated probably 40,000 words in stuff about the world that is not fiction in the world. And I, I, it's really interesting and useful, and I'm learning a ton. But most of the writers, and this is the way my own books are, I will have an outline. But it's, it's kind of just this construct. And in some ways, what it does is it gives me license to go forward, because um, I have a direction. But I absolutely find that as I'm writing those scenes, I, and I give myself this permission, that they veer. And, and creation happens all the time. So the, it's not always that I end up locked into a scene. I'm not that kind of writer. And I think for people who feel slavish to the outline, that's, that's a problem. Um, so I think there's this, I guess my thing is there's this middle ground where there is some value in having some sense of where you're going. Um, and doing some sort of pre-world work and pre-character work, uh, but then knowing that all of that, that all of that is just giving you this this direction, and then you're going to allow yourself to do a lot of pantsing along the way, and it, it ultimately it's whatever's going to work for you. But I have found I would say 80% of the writers that I talk to fall into this middle ground. They're not die like George Martin is a pantser, 100% pantser. Um, and Dan Simmons, who is probably my favorite writer, is a complete pantser. So um, uh, Pat Rothfuss is a pantser. So there's, you know, you see success on company. you see success on both sides of the equation. Yeah. So I, um, as someone who has who has who does both, uh, depending on the situation, um, I I I think at least for me, discovery writing is more fun. Um, it's, and that's not to say that, you know, if I outline something that it's not fun and it's, uh, you know, I can geek out about outlining and like story structure. I think that's interesting in a different way, but like discovery writing, there's something about just letting, starting with a character in a situation and just seeing where that goes, maybe having a vague idea of where I want it to end up, but just seeing how things develop that, uh, is just really cool. And I will say, uh, this, <laughs> I guess this doesn't happen to me all the time, so I don't think that I'm like super crazy but I am I guess a little bit crazy because when I when I discovery write is when I start to have like dreams about my characters and I like hear their voices and like get a little bit schizophrenic about it right and, and I think a good way um, and that doesn't happen when I outline uh, which is, again is fine um, and it's not like anything super revelatory comes through that like schizophrenic those schizophrenic episodes but uh, but it, it is interesting and kind of adds a little bit of a spice to the process um, and I do want to agree with Jessica that uh, it it give it does give me a lot more freedom. Like I I do think outlines are absolutely and should be malleable, right, and and changeable. Um, but it is easier to let a character kind of take control and go somewhere you didn't expect the story to go when you're when you're discovery writing, when you're literally just discovering what that character wants to do as they do it. Um, I think that's easier. And I will say I don't want to I want to be careful how I say this, but you know, uh, Peter, you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned George R. R. Martin and Patrick Rothfuss, who are discovery writers. 
and it takes them a long time to finish books, right? So I think that might be, I guess I'm maybe jumping the gun here, that might be s oh, something of a downside, right? And obviously those, those two, those two people two have... two books a year and had three babies. I know, and I'm, oh, I, I don't yeah. think everybody... Pants and diaper at the same oh, yeah. time. <laughs> Isn't that the same thing, though? There. Pantsing and diaper? But, no, yeah. what, but, is, what is putting on? Right. But, like, <laughs> it's just, everyone is different, though. Absolutely, slow yeah. Writers. yeah. I always said about Pat when people were like, but he has not the second book. And I'm just like, did everyone miss the memo where he worked on that first book for 10 years? Oh, and yeah. then they scheduled book two for two years later. I was right. like, there, there, I knew that wasn't happening. <laughs> well, that's, the story is even more interesting because he wrote a million words that it was one book. And then when he got his book deal, it's like, we can't publish a million yeah. word book. So what we're going to do is ask you to make it three books. But you can't just cut it off at 333,000 words. It needs a book shape. So he had to go back and refactor so much of that yeah. in order to give each of those a book shape. Yeah. And when he revises, his, his line is, I'm not just fixing comma splices. I'm doing real revision, which yeah. means writing new scenes. Um, I think one of the, the, I heard Martin say this. He said, you know, I'm a discovery writer. What happens? One, my characters do what I say. It's not that, hey, I let them take me somewhere, I'm discovering. He says, no, my characters do what I tell them to do. But I go down paths that don't pan out. And so I write a lot of words that I end up having to throw away. So that's his process. Stephen King is also a pantser. I don't think he throws anything away. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yep. He throws it all out oh, there. Oh, yeah. Stevie. <laughs> I don't know if that's an argument for or against yeah. pantsing. Yeah. Well, I think... I'm just going to say this because he's not here and I'm sure none of you will tell on me. <laughs> Stephen King for me is very hit or miss to an extreme degree. Mm -hmm. I think some of his books like Salem's Lot, some of his short stories have been some of the most phenomenal books of the English language and some of his stuff will one day be used for toilet paper after the apocalypse. I'm just going to throw that out there, you know, <laughs> because like, because he does, he throws it all out there on the page and is like, well, there's a book. And it's like, that was, that whole book was a dead end, my friend. <laughs> and then some of it's like, no, that was genius. You, you, you were right on that one. So I think he's very uneven in that way. And, and the whole, I mean, I, I can, I can relate to that. Yeah. Me if you tell yeah. him Well, when I hey, see Steve, him tomorrow, Jessica I'll says, know. Yeah, yeah. He's you know what Jessica says about you. Yeah. Uh, for me, the, the whole reason I even tried outlining to begin with, I, I was a straight discovery writer for a long time. Um, and I, I sold book one of my series, which I'd, or I sold, a I sold book one and ended up selling all the entire series, five books. And, uh, and I discovery written book one. I started book two it, with the intention to discovery write it. I had a very, very loose outline, right? Just general points I wanted to hit along the way. And I, uh, my first book was 140,000 words long. Book two, at one point, was 270,000 words long. And it was like, nothing was happening, right? It was, it was this problem where I was going expanding, but I wasn't making progress with the story. And so I had a long talk with my, with my agent and ended up cutting uh, that down to about 140,000 words. So about half the book I cut out. Um, and that's when I started to do a little bit more outlining and that helps me st personally streamline my process. And I definitely acknowledge that yeah. this is a very subjective thing, right? Like um, some people can really cruise with discovery writing yeah. and, and, um, and some people can Outlining is a slow process for them. I, I think it depends on who you are. And but. see, I would have loved to have this advice when I was first starting out because I heard a lot of things where I'm like, oh, you got to outline, you got to outline. And it really is this weird hybrid. Every author is going to find their own way to write the books. I mean, no author does it the same as another author. So, I mean, if something's working for you, keep going with it. I started trying to outline after everyone was telling me to outline. And I would outline an entire book like they told me, and none of those books ever got written. Because for me, the magic of discovering the story was gone. I already knew the ending, I already knew how it all happened, and I had no motivation to actually write the book after that. And so I learned that I just had to embrace my style. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you guys get that from what we're all saying because every single writer has their own level of discovery their own level of outlining and like peter said it really can be a hybrid and as long as it works for you it's great so um i'm curious since most of you kind of have a level 
like how do you make discovery writing like work from a professional standpoint when you're working with editors and you have deadlines and sometimes you don't have as much time to discover as you would like um, how do you sort of get through and find a process that works for you under time constraints <laughs> how do we do that? That's a good question. <laughs> how does that work? Well, the, my answer to that is the, the first thing is if you're a professional writer, you're not waiting for the muse to hit. You're sitting down in your chair every day and putting in the time. Um, one of my good friends is, is a Canadian writer by the name of Jack White. Have you guys read Jack White? With a Y, oh, not, the, yeah. not the musician. That's, that Jack White with a Y, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. Everyone write he's that down. Scottish. Everyone under, yeah. And he's fond of saying. I was going to say he's Canadian. He's Canadian. Well, he's Scottish, but he's been in Canada since he's oh, okay. like super young person. Um, and he, he says the only way to, he does it with a Scottish brogue, which I won't attempt. He says the <laughs> only way to do it is to put your ass in the chair. And it's just a restatement of you have to put in the time. So there's a little bit of working against a deadline is. You know, it's, it's not all romantic. And one of the interesting things that, that most writers I know find is the days when they think that the words are crap and it's just not flowing and it, they don't get as much down, but they showed up and they put in their time versus the days when it seems like, oh my gosh, I'm the best writer on the planet. That was beautiful. And you look back, you don't know the difference. You can't, you can't identify which days you thought were great and which weren't. Uh, and I think that's a testament to the idea that if you put in the time, that you'll get to where you're going. Now, having said that, let's imagine you get a, a book deal and your publisher says, okay, we've got a trilogy, you're gonna deliver one every year. And you know that your discovery process, that you got that first book to make the deal with, took you eight years. It's a problem. Um, this is why, for me, I like this idea um, of having some kind of outline. And there's all kinds of tools for this. And I actually, frankly, don't, I think sometimes the tools can psych you out. Like, oh, that, what's the one that everybody, Scrivener. Mm -hmm. People like to use Scrivener. Um, to me, that's way too much software. Um, I will just, some people use whiteboards. I'll use just a simple Excel spreadsheet. And all I do is I give myself a, a rough destination. And I know some plot points. Um, I know who my characters are. There's some of that work that I've done you know, already. Um, I don't do a ton of pre-writing um, the way some do, but th what that does for me is I can sit down every day and I have a destination. And it doesn't mean that I don't do revision. I absolutely do, and I, work, I build that into my, my work back. At Microsoft, when, where I worked for years, we had this idea of a work back schedule, which is here's my point in time when I have to deliver a product, and then there are milestones that get me there. And one of them for me had to be, I need to have at least a couple of weeks where I'm gonna go back through everything I've written. And I'll revise and I will polish and, you know, and, I'll, and I'll make notes for myself along the way in parentheses or, or I'll mark them somehow that I know I have to revisit something. Um, but that's why I like outlines. Not because I want this absolute roadmap down to every single like, plot point. I just, it gives me this freedom. It's hard to describe. But it's like, um, I never have a moment where I sit down and I'm staring at a blank page and I don't know what to do. There's, I, there's an, I've roughed in enough. And then I know that I sit down and there are days when everything that I do is just the bare, has the barest resemblance to what was in the outline. Um, so that's what works for me. And I, I've never had to miss a deadline because the, that approach is, has served me to hit those deadlines. But, you know, everybody's different. I found that um, similar to what you're saying, like, I mean, I don't just say to my editor, I am, I am writing a book. <laughs> and she hands me money and we go, la la, I'll see you in April. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have to, you can't sell that. And my first book was done. My first book obviously was finished. I showed her a manuscript. She read the manuscript at a retreat and was like, fabulous, let's publish this. So it was done. Hearing a yes for one thing was so amazing <laughs> that when I told her about my next book idea I had, she gave me a deadline. She's like, great, I would love to see that in about nine months, like a first draft of that. 
I had a reason to put my butt in the chair and write the book. Mm -hmm. And instead of just occasionally when I felt the mood strike going up there and rubbing my feet across my little dog and da 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 da, oh now I'm gonna go eat some snacks. I was like, oh, she wants to see this in nine months. Here we go. And that's, that's how my books are getting written now is that I will tell her. I don't say like, yeah, it's a book. There are ponies in it. I'm like, no. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the herd stallion and three of the mares from their, from their herd of horses have been kidnapped. And they have two weeks to find out who kidnapped them and get them back where they will be caught behind enemy lines when war breaks out. There you go. I, does that count as an outline? Am I no longer a pantser? I say no. Anyway, Turn in your is, card. That is what I had to tell my editor just the other day, and she said, great, let's see that by April 1st of a rough draft, and I said, sure. So every day I know that I'm writing on this story that I have roughly told her in two sentences, and so I know how many words, I know how long this book is going to be, it's middle grade, it's going to be the third book in a trilogy, you don't want it to be 140,000 words because the first two were 60,000, so, you know, I'm not suddenly going to pull a Harry Potter the Deathly Hallows or something like that on her. <laughs> so I know it's going to be about 60,000 words, and I'm going to write to that so I know how many words per day that I need to meet, and if I have days where I hit 3,000 words, it, that's great because I know there's going to be the day the next week when somebody's going to throw up on me or something and like not like I work in a bar but I have three children. Yeah, but like, <laughs> yeah it's pretty. Like somebody's going to somebody's going to throw up or two weeks ago my dog was eaten by a larger dog and had to have her spleen removed and so oh I had gosh, to sit and hold a little dog so she wouldn't chew her stitches Jeez. and so I only got 300 words that day because my dog got eaten by a dumb labradoodle <laughs> <laughs> named Mocha. Mocha, no! Mocha, no! And I'm like, oh Mocha, God. you're gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so there were 300 words that day, but yeah. a couple of days later, when the dog was in a pretty good state with her pain meds, I was able to do 3,000 words and make up for the difference, you know? Yeah. So you just know you've got it. You've got to meet that goal. You've got that goal. And that's what you're working towards. And you kind of will start knowing how long it's going to take you. And meanwhile, when I have free time, I am working on other things, and they're taking a lot longer. For the same length of books, I have a, a Christmas book that I only work on in December when the mood strikes, and I am not on deadline for once during the year. And so it's taken me, I'm almost done with it now, but it's been five Christmases that I have worked on this book, and I'm just <laughs> up to the epilogue now, and we're sitting pretty. Nice. But because I don't have a deadline, I'm just sort of really feeling that one out. If you give me a deadline, I'll go for it. But, yeah. So... I, th I think sometimes as a writing community, we conflate the idea of a discovery writer with that of the writer who does only write when the muse strikes or something. And they're not the same thing. They can be. Uh, that's, they're not mutually exclusive it's totally, either. But it's totally picturing someone like either sitting on a cliff with their right. like leather-bound notebook. I feel that I shall write yeah, today. Like this that's super different. whimsical. That's, I don't know what that is. No, yeah. no, yeah. <laughs> and in fact, I think it, if if you are a discovery writer, you I don't maybe wear have a dramatic gown. And no, fly yeah, and swing. yeah. <laughs> Manic pixie dream writer. Like no, that's not yeah, no. no. Yeah, yeah. I so, have a snuggie. <laughs> yeah. In an office. So. It's um. But you know, there's, there's, there's considerations here. If you're a person who has a day job and you get one hour to write. You better bet you're gonna get a thousand words in that hour every day. <laughs> yeah, and, and you have a deadline. Okay. Now, you know, if you don't have either independent wealth or a spouse who is paying for groceries, now all of a sudden you have time <laughs> considerations. Like, can you be a full discovery writer and deliver a book in six months? That, you know, I, I, was ta I went to, to lunch with a guy, um, Brian Lee Durfee, and he was talking about to hit his deadline. He missed every birthday, every family party. He did all of that stuff because when he wasn't at work, he had to be writing. So that's something you need to consider. Like when you start to get real publishing, because the last thing you also want to do is get a reputation for not hitting a deadline. Now let me tell you a quick story about the Deathly Hallows. Uh, good old J.K. Rowling cost many a writer their writing careers because she was so late that the way the publishing company made up the difference is they cut books from debut authors and midlist authors. Not cool when you're late with a book and that has fiscal implications for your publisher and the consequences that can have for a different writer. So pants well, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Just, On the other hand, many of us are published because of her books. So there's a little give and take there. Well, yeah, I'm but. Published by, uh, my books are all published by Bloomsbury, which did not exist as an American publisher huh. until they made so much money off her first three books that they branched out into America, where they don't publish 
they are not. Harry Potter is not published in America by Bloomsbury because they didn't have an American office when they started out. So they're published by Scholastic and Arthur Levine. But they made so much money off of them that they floated the rest of us for years, and they were able to take a chance on a bunch of us who just suddenly decided we were going to write about dragons. But those things aren't mutually exclusive. Yeah. They would have still made the money off the book and oh, could yeah. have still published a, a ton of York novels and not had to cut and kill writers' careers if she'd hit her deadline. Yes. Also, no one has ever accused them of being this publisher. Well, I know. <laughs> And, and we, story there's a whole time. panel about <laughs> publishers and their level of smarts. Yeah. Um, it, the the, the cautionary tale is just, you know, once you get into a professional level, um, your, whatever your process, uh, be professional. Yeah. And this particular topic has potentially an effect on your ability to meet a deadline. If the outlining just really doesn't work for you, which it kind of doesn't for me, I kind of take a backwards approach where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna write a really crappy draft because I do shine in editing. So if I have enough time to edit a crap draft, I can turn it into something amazing. But if I don't have the book to work with at all, then I'm, I got nothing. So um, when I'm on a deadline, I try to get that book out and I try not to think about all the mistakes that are happening along the way because I know I can fix them later. And then I go back and I actually do like a backwards outline. Like I will write from there. I'm like, okay, here's my giant outline of a crap first draft. And these are the good things, these are the bad things. And let's edit this into the ground. Um, so there's many ways to accomplish the same thing. Um, try them out if you're not sure which one works for you yet. Uh, you'll find it. And Can I say see. one more thing about that? Yes. So I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of writers give the advice that, you know, one of the best things you can do besides write is to read. And I think that I would, I hesitate, hesitate to say that it's doubly important for, uh, for discovery writers, but, uh, but structure, like story structure is important to understand. You don't have to outline something, but you need to understand how a story works. And if you're not going to outline something, the best way to do that is to read a lot of stories to understand how we tell stories and the tropes and the, you know, the turns and the twists and the beats that every story hits um, wow. or most stories hit, right? Sometimes in inverted so ways or something. So your specific genre yeah. in those two. Yeah. Because there are patterns. Mm -hmm. And if you do learn the patterns, you can start to self-edit along the way. You're like, I'm not having... I need a twist here, I yeah. need a, re a reveal here, I need these things. And you, you'll be able to do that if you know your genre really well. And, and another tool that I've used is to outline something in revision, right? So I'll discovery write something, and then after I've written it, I look at it and say, okay, how does this fit as a story? And I kind of make an outline, a little, I structure it and look at it, take a step back and say, well, I'm clearly missing these parts, right? I need something here. Or I've done this like three times, I don't need every one of these scenes. And I can, I can kind of judge my story from there and, and tighten it up. Yeah, let's move into that too. Um, what does your editing process look like after a discovery draft? Like, what do you guys think are the most essential things to start considering after that? Because I feel like you gotta embrace really good editing if you're gonna stay a pantser, you know? You have to accept that that's part of the process, is the editing side of things. Mm -hmm. I, I rarely have time because of my publishing schedule to like say get beta readers or anything like that but I do have my my agent is wonderful and she also is an editor and and that is her training and so as I go along I will give her chunks and she will just flag not like you're not doing semicolons right again I'm like I will never do semicolons right okay lady <laughs> 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 Uh, but she will flag things like, whoa, 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 this is getting weird, or like there were zero jokes in the first five chapters and suddenly your main character starting chapter seven is jokey McJoke face. <laughs> and so like, if there, you know, if the tone is off, if I'm sh yeah. suddenly shifted point of view for no good reason or something, she'll flag that before I get the book finished so that I can go back and go through it and fix that. But then we go to my editor and I have worked with wonderful editors that I trust implicitly that know kind of what state my book is going to be in when I turn it in. 
and they know I will listen to them when they when they talk to them and will consider I'm not going to cave into everything they say but we'll have a good talk about like what maybe needs to be fixed and stuff like that and what's working especially well and so I edit usually with someone I don't just go back over and over my own writing at all I let someone else lead me through because I think it's genius everything I've put <laughs> down on the page is absolutely genius if I read it to my back to myself I'd be like yes 100% this is the Pulitzer winner yep. <laughs> you know um, so I don't ever I don't ever look at it myself I look at it with people I trust who have the training an agent and an editor and they look at it and I work with them the, you know, I agree with what you said. I think it's also a reflection of your career state. Yeah. Um, if you're a writer who is not published and yeah. you don't have the, the advantage of an agent and editor, then... You do need a beta reader or... You do need a beta reader. Another set of eyes. Absolutely, because you have to have a little bit of um, objectivity that's looking at your manuscript. I would, I would echo, though, that I think that there's a fair amount that you can learn. Like coming to places like this and, and starting to internalize craft with this sort of structured part of your brain, which I truly believe kind of seeps in. I don't think you should sit down, like that. one of the, the subtitle for this whole thing is like making the most of draft zero. Yeah. I think you should absolutely have fun. You should dare to fail spectacularly and you should just put it all out there and know that there's gonna be a point in time where you're gonna go back and you're gonna begin to refine. And don't be some nuggets of gold in sections that you won't need to do much with and other sections that may need a lot more revision. Um, it's, it's valuable for you to spend the time learning craft techniques, but, but don't put those, don't bring those with you into your writing sessions. When you're writing, um, I, I'm a true believer that the stuff you learn kind of subconsciously comes out in your writing. And you're not thinking about, okay, I need a semicolon here. Those kinds of things don't enter in. You just write and you'll make those kinds of mistakes and you do need to have, I believe, at least early on, you're going to need to have some of those skills yourself to go back and do some polishing. Um, but it's invaluable for you to get beta readers. Um, I, for me personally, to a lesser degree, like writing groups, um, I don't find as much value in those before you try and get it in front of an agent or an editor. Because what you, the first time they read your, your book, you want it to be as polished as it can be. Um, Yes, they can recognize greatness, you know, diamonds in the rough, but you don't want to have, to have them wade through that too much. Um, you know, the, the, uh, in hearing you talk, it makes me think that the difference, like with, with Stephen King, I'm guessing he's not taking any, any editing. And right? he has bemoaned that fact, actually. Stephen King has talked about the fact that they do not edit him. They basically run spell checker across it. Yeah. And he does not like that. But they're like, dude, you're Stephen King. Stephen King <laughs> Who wants stuff. to be the person, right? You got this yeah. all wrong. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's why. He's like, they act like, oh, you'll sell no matter what. And he's like, but somebody help me. What, what freshly out of college kid is going to be the one to tell yeah. Stephen King whose writing book they studied in school? Uh -huh. This chapter is crap. You, you should know? really yeah. consider reading this craft book, Steve. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, well. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, I agree that if, if you have the opportunity to get your manuscript under the eyes of like a professional agent or editor, absolutely do that. Uh, beta readers are very, very useful if you don't have that opportunity. And I just want to echo, I, I kind of, writing groups for me are hit and miss as well. Um, I, when, I'm, when I'm in the process of discovery writing, it is worthless for me to submit a, a story to a writing group because their, their feedback often, like they're often suggesting things and it's, kind of messing with my idea of the story and where my subconscious wants the story to go. That doesn't work well. When I'm outlining a story or when I've already done a pass of a finished, you know, discovery written book, it's totally great. Writing groups work very well for me. Um, but but I would and other people may be different, right? You may be you may love submitting your discovery written stories to a writing group. That's great. Um, but it may be something to consider. Uh, but yeah, I think there's lots of tools available to to help help you in the editing process. Um, it's just a matter of finding what works for you. Do one thing to look for. Um, I I had a, a writing group experience that was very bad, and my writing group turned extremely toxic. Mm. And anyway, um, I shan't. I shall say no more. But um, one one problem that I did have was that about half the people in that group did not read the type of stuff I was writing. Yeah. So but they still felt very compelled to give me a critique 
in a genre they had never seen before. <coughs> so and and there and one dude in particular was he was he was a man by dang and all this girly stuff with the feelings and the clothes. <laughs> the clothes. He would just put a big X over it Why anytime that... <laughs> clothing was mentioned in this manuscript. <laughs> Um, which still has not been published because it is such a mess and I blame them entirely. Uh. But he would put a big X across any time the clothing was mentioned and then be super confused later when this girl turned invisible because he X'd out without reading because it was womanly things the part where her dress was an invisibility cloak, basically. <laughs> I had her clothing, her makeup had magic in it. So you knew when she was getting, she was a spy for frack's sake. So when she was putting on her stuff, certain stuff, she could turn invisible. She could do this. She had like the poison lipstick. The okay, I'm really mad that they ruined this. Big, <laughs> big X across that. All the women with their painted lips and big X across it. And then he'd go, why is that guy dead? Oh my God. And anytime someone felt emotions, no, men don't like emotions, and why do we have to read this book about a woman anyway? And I was like, sir, please return to the Middle Ages where you were more comfortable. <laughs> but, so that's one thing, but I genuinely had other lovely people in this group who were like, well, I have only read cozy murder mysteries set in British villages where everyone is dying left and right, so I don't know what to tell you about this fantasy novel. But I'm gonna try. <laughs> so, like, the, their advice was useless. Yeah. But there were one or two people in that group that also read fantasy and were at least passing familiar with YA fantasy. They were able to give me some very valuable feedback about, you know, what worked and didn't work. But it was like two people out of ten. So, you know, find, you don't hand your, if your you're husband, if your husband does not read fiction, don't hand him your novel and go, Tell me what you love about it, sweetie, because he'll just tell you he loves it. He's being dishonest to you. <laughs> Find a beta reader who that is their jam. Hire a teenager, whatever you need to do, you know, and tell and just go like, what did you like? What did you hate? You know, just get it. But don't go to someone who has only read Star Trek tie-in novels for the last 50 years and go, Dad, would you read this for me? If it's not a Star Trek tie-in novel. Dad can't help you. Yeah. Husbands are liars. Dad can't help you. I think what's <laughs> you take nothing from this. It is that. I think what's also important to um, just we're, we we got to go to Q and A here soon, but um, I want you guys to remember that your stories are malleable. When I was first writing, I thought I wrote my first draft and it was carved into stone, <laughs> and that changing anything about it would ultimately break the entire sculpture I just created. And it took me a long time to get past the idea that a revision would make my story worse because I would mess it up somehow. Um, but when I started realizing, and it, and it was an agent ultimately who walked me through a real in-depth plot, character, revision, that I realized how malleable my story was and how much it could be stretched and twisted and pulled and still maintain its shape and its message and the characters um, and I have never done a revision that made my story worse um, so don't be afraid to just be like yeah I messed up a lot of things let's undo that and try it again and do the revisions that people give you if they're within genre and they know what they're talking about. Yes. Which is very important. No, there no will be story people who will is mess so precious, up. no matter how dear to your heart that idea is, no story is so precious that it, that it cannot be changed a little bit to make it better. Yes. Um, and so with but that... you do have to go through the five stages of grief when you get editorial notes. It's yes, just, it is true. You're like, no, no, that can't be... Oh, yeah. There's, right. there's <laughs> denial, there's anger, yeah. there's like bargaining, it's all... Yeah. <laughs> so we have about five minutes left, and I'd love to open it up to questions. Somebody else pick, because I'm going to give them a book, and I don't want to be biased. Pick a, pick a person. In the corner. Okay. Uh, that's a completely subjective. Yeah. Every writer's um, different. On Are you asking us personally? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so, for me, um, I usually do do a complete draft, and then I will go back over it, and and that's what goes to my editor. The thing with Brandon, 
is going through a lot more <laughs> stages. Interesting. Um, because we're we're using a process that he that that he uses, and um, it's it's both are both are viable. Um, so I guess the moral of the story is when you collaborate, you compromise. Uh, for me, I um, I do one really good healthy draft and then I go back over it once. I think that could change not just for people but project to project. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a book that still has does not have a release date because I have written the book from scratch five times and there's still just something off about it and we're not sure if it's the narrator or what the deal is but we're still I'm still working through it, bouncing ideas off my editor and I've never had that happen before. I've had books go almost straight into copy editing where they just take like draft one just went straight into getting grammar copy edited because mm. it was tight enough and I've had and then the next book in that series I rewrote ex X'd out a complete character and point of view and just you know you, you can't say every project's going to be different yep. there's no wrong if you That's if you're right. on draft seven you don't go well this is crap you know draft eight will be the one that you know you don't know the extreme yeah. there is <laughs> Pat Pat did over 80 revisions no, that's too many. Now that's yeah. the wrong that's, answer. That's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's his process. <laughs> uh, how about here in the middle? You, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm a dancer as well, and it makes me see things differently. Like, I don't I know people who do that, Alina do. Johnson or Liz Isaacson, she's very much, she writes scenes and then she, she takes all the scenes and lines them up and, and connects them with transitions. So it is possible I have no if idea. it works yeah. That's, for you. I mean, I, 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 I can both discovery write and outline, but I, I cannot, I, when I do either of those, that is something I can't do. Like I, so I think it depends. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure people do it. I'm a very. I have no writer. words about how to do that. To but yeah, when I am writing, I, I have to go pretty yeah. much. But if you don't, you're not wrong. Yeah. All right. Uh, how about way in the back? Um, there. So I um, <coughs> just want to play. Okay. So I have um, Do you feel like it's going well and you know kind of what you're aiming for for the ending? Like yeah. you, you, then just then keep going. Yeah. Just push it. forward, do it, finish, finish it. it. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, when you finish you it, absolutely do those things. Either. Yeah, but. you can find the writing group after that yeah. and look at revisions after that. Mm -hmm. I always say push through. But if you, unless, meet, some, if you meet some like minded yeah. people or some people that are like, hey, I would love to read that, don't say no. Yeah. Unless. Sure. I mean, the one the one time I ever say no, don't submit that is if somebody's like, well, I've written two chapters and I'm about to meet this editor. Should I pitch it to them? Well, yeah. what happens if they ask to see the whole book? Yeah. yeah. And you're I'll like, well, you could wait anywhere from six months to ten years for the rest of the book. I have money yeah. now, please. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but it's funny because all of these answers have uh, the con con contraindications. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because <laughs> I know somebody but who I sold somebody a book yet. with two chapters. <laughs> And the editor went back and said, I'd love to see that. Editors are so busy. They're not going back to their office saying, where's that book that they were promising me? <laughs> Except for that one editor who was with my friend. You know what I mean? Right, like, you right. So the, so <laughs> the, and they were able to go back. They spent a couple months, finished the book, sent it in, bang. The, I, I think the answer to your question is, that's different for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you, you've written half that book. Um, I know a lot of writers who they will write a chapter they will go back and revise and revise yeah. till that chapter is good, and then they move on. That works for them. That would drive me crazy. I could never do that. And, and I have actually started over from the middle and had to revise because I saw a massive flaw. Like it was a massive changing the whole book sort of flaw. And it was like, yeah, I mean, it would be worthless to write the rest because so much is changing. So it's situational too. But if you feel like it's going well, just finish. Yeah. Um, let's see what time it is. I'm sorry, we're out of time. The Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>